Mashika, we ready? Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's meeting. Today, it's the uh, GIT IBD Gecko iteration of our series. Welcome to all of you. We've had just under 100 registrations, predominantly from people within the mother continent. Um, we do have, for the first time, somebody from Angola. Welcome to the meeting. And I believe we have two people from the United Kingdom who've also joined on this meeting. So welcome to all of you. Um, and I hope we're going to have a wonderful uh, session this afternoon. So today we uh, have a very interesting uh, topic, which is really problematic in clinical practice. We're going to kick off uh, with a case presentation and mini review uh, on pyotitis. This is going to be given by Mark Ostrovsky. He's based at Charlotte Matreke Hospital, that is in Johannesburg. He's actually a fellow uh, in gastroenterology uh, wrote his uh, exit exams uh, last week. Uh, Mark, I hope uh, the paper was palatable. Um, when Mark is finished, uh, then uh, we will uh, then go to the second part of the meeting uh, with a video presentation, and that will be introduced by Professor Watermeyer based uh, in Cape Town. So um, without further ado, um, Mark, uh, please uh, do your presentation. While he's doing the presentation, please do feel free to uh, post your questions on the chat box. But actually we do enjoy the interaction. So um, if you know how to do it, please raise your hand and then uh, you, know, you can uh, unmute and put on your video so that we can see who you are. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon colleagues. Thank you, Prof. Um, so as uh, Prof mentioned, I'm Mark Ostrovsky. I'm currently a fellow in medical gastroenterology at uh, Charlotte Maxeke Johannesburg Academic Hospital, as well as Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center in uh, Johannesburg. And thank you for the opportunity to, um, to present today. The topic I will be presenting is on pouchitis. Um, what's new in 2021? So just an overview, uh, I'll be giving a case presentation. Um, I will just run through some definitions, uh, diagnostic requirements, therapy options, biological agents in pouchitis, and some take home points. So to start with our, with our case presentation, a gentleman, Mr. KK, who's a 36-year-old gentleman, uh, was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2011. The extent of the disease was noted to be pancolitis. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the actual images or the biopsy results from that original scope. This is all based on, on a report. Uh, the rest of his background history, he had no uh, extraintestinal manifestations, no primary sclerosing cholangitis. He's a non-smoker. And there was no history of uh, any admissions for acute severe ulcerative colitis. So he presented to us here in Joburg in 2012 uh, with really the main complaint of uh, 10 stools a day, most of which, or at least half of which, uh, were bloody in nature. Uh, he had significant uh, tenesmus, nocturnal symptoms, as well as abdominal cramping. An endoscopy was performed, uh, and this showed a pancolitis with a Mayo 2 disease. He was assessed as having moderate disease activity based on the modified Mayo score. So at this time point, so this is going back to 2012, uh, we did some, some blood investigations and some safety bloods for azathioprine were performed. Uh, I could not find uh, a TPMT done at the time and his EBB serology was done only subsequently later on in uh, sort of in his course of follow-up. Uh, his hep studies were negative. He was not immune to hep B and so he did receive uh, the vaccination. Uh, at this point in time. And he was started on acetyl, azathioprine, and prednisone. And unfortunately, he did not have an adequate response to this therapy, and the azathioprine was stopped in 2013. He was then given a trial of methotrexate uh, for four months, and this again was stopped as a result of poor response. He was put onto 25 milligrams subcutaneous uh, weekly. Finally, he was given a trial of, uh, of tacrolimus uh, for about a year, and again, this was stopped as a result of a poor clinical response. So just of note, we did not have any access to biological therapy at this point in time. And so the patient was counseled and the decision was taken for this patient to undergo surgery. So he went for a restorative proctocolectomy with an allele, with an allele pouch, anal anastomosis. And as noted, his indication was that of failed medical therapy. Unfortunately, the patient was lost to follow up up until uh, 2019 from, uh, from around just after his surgery. 
So between May of 2019 and October of 2020, he presented uh, with three documented episodes of chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis. And this was based on his symptoms. He was passing at each time point about 15 stools a day uh, with no blood PR, but he had significant nocturnal symptoms and he had tenesmus. And really these were having, a, as one could imagine, a significant impact on his quality of life. He was scoped at each one of these time points. And again, the features were in keeping. He had aphloid lesions, erosions, uh, some, some ulcerations and mucus exudates. The histology was also in keeping and he had no response to antibiotic therapy. Just importantly, uh, the secondary causes for this clinical presentation were ruled out. I'm not going to go into too much detail at this point because in the talk that's uh, the video presentation, Dr. Dotan will uh, address this in more detail. But, you know, just importantly, we ruled out some of the infective etiologies like CMV and C. diff. Uh, and also we ruled out Crohn's disease, uh, de novo Crohn's rather, uh, in this patient. These are some of the investigations for, uh, for our patient. And I've only included, it's a long period of follow-up, so I've only included his investigations at the time of these pouchitis episodes. And of significance, really, his renal function remained normal. His CRP was always less than 10. His, his counts never really dramatically changed. His HP was always normal. Um, his CMV viral load was, was undetectable. His stool CDF was negative. And the only fecal CalPro that I, I had access to was that which was done in October, which was the third episode of, of Pouchitis, and that was 415. Unfortunately, a P anchor has not been done up to this point in his follow-up. In terms of managing him, um, we had opted throughout each one of these episodes to go with ciprofloxacin, 500 milligrams twice a day, and flagell, 400 milligrams three times a day for a month. And unfortunately, he did not respond adequately. Uh, his symptoms, he persisted with significant uh, uh, stool frequencies, passing diarrheal stools, again, up to about 10 to 15 times a day. Uh, he was given a trial of budesonide, uh, nine milligrams for, per day, and that was for eight weeks. And unfortunately, also it didn't respond. And finally, we tried acetyl, both suppositories um, and tablets for this patient, and still no adequate clinical response. So at this point in time, uh, we have a patient who we don't really have very much further medically to offer him. We don't have VSL-3, which I'll allude to a little later in the talk. And we also, unfortunately, have a very um, restricted accessibility to anti-TNF agents uh, and really it's for our patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease so he is not uh, on that either. So to step away from our case just to run through uh, pouchitis, uh, we'll go through some definitions and uh, really pouchitis is a non-specific inflammation of the ileal reservoir and it is the most common complication after an ileal pouch uh, anal anastomosis for ulcerative colitis. Uh, it can occur up to in up to 50% of patients uh, at 10 years post RPAA. Um, and the, the prevalence or, or the, the highest risk period is actually within the first year after surgery. So the, the definitions are somewhat arbitrary, uh, but they do help us to tailor our therapy for each one of these uh, presentations. So just with acute pouchitis, it is defined as symptoms less than four weeks. Chronic pouchitis are those symptoms that last for more than four weeks. Antibiotic responsive is, as it sounds, that patients respond to a two-week course of a single antibiotic therapy, or if a patient has had less than four episodes in a year. Antibiotic dependent is those patients that require uh, maintenance, uh, or rather antibiotics uh, to maintain remission. And finally, antibiotic refractory patients who are those who do not respond to a four-week course of antibiotics. This is just a, a, a a cartoon showing the anatomic landmarks of the J pouch, which is the most common pouch that is utilized today. Uh, so just to draw attention, I don't know if my, my, doesn't look like my cursor is working, but really what's important is the afferent limb is very important. It's important that when one does a pouchoscopy that we intubate the afferent limb, because this is the area where one may find features of de novo Crohn's disease. So we need to look for fistulous tract stricturing, deep serpiginous ulceration or cobblestoning. Uh, so, so it is very important to intubate and take a look um, at that area. When, do, when looking at echo, uh, the echo statement in terms of making a diagnosis requires the presence of symptoms together with characteristic endoscopic features as well as hist histolo histology. So just some risk factors for pouchitis are those of extensive uh, UC, 
PSC being a non-smoker, positive uh, P. anchor serology and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use. And in our patient, he had the extensive UC and the fact that he was a non-smoker, but he didn't have any of the other features, although we don't have a P. anchor serology on him. So I, I, I think this is a bit of a busy slide, but this was just, a, uh, just to show what the PDI is, so the Pouch Disease Activity Index. Uh, and essentially, it really looks at uh, you know, symptoms, so stool frequency and bleeding, as well as urgency and fever, it looks at endoscopic features, some of which you can see on the left of your screen, as well as um, some histological criteria. So just unfortunately, I don't have imaging of, uh, or images rather of his uh, endoscopy that we performed, uh, but really uh, he, his findings were that of uh, the picture C and D on your screen. So that of really affluid uh, lesions or ulcers, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a, a mucus exudates together with erythema. He did not have, and that would be in keeping really with a moderate pouchitis, not so much a severe pouchitis, which are more the, the lesions uh, where on pictures E and F where you have deep ulceration. So what ECHO says about therapy is uh, really in terms of your acute treatment, um, really it's, it's, it's antibiotic therapy. And ECHO says that we should really pick an antibiotic for a two week period. Uh, and they sort of uh, advise going with Cipro based on its better side effect profile. In terms of chronic pouchitis, now ECHO would sort of advise us to give a combination of two antibiotics. Uh, so again, in our case, we go Flagyl and Cipro and that for a month period. Uh, other options available, oral budesonide, which if you recall, our patient, we gave a trial, he did not respond. Uh, oral beclomethasone dipropionate, as well as tacrolimus. Uh, and this is now where we're going to get into the biological uh, side of things where infliximab uh, and to a lesser extent adalimumab may be uh, alternative therapies. So just when looking at, um, at the literature, th this, uh, this, this review really um, meta-analysis looks at uh, biologics and the anti-TNF group in general really. Uh, there are a couple of studies that it's looked at here, and just what's important is uh, the percentage of remission when you look at this meta-analysis is up around 50%. However, it needs to be read with caution because even when looking at this forest plot, you can see there's a significant heterogeneity. Uh, I mean, the, the responses are ranging from about 20% all the way through to 100%. So uh, that needs to be taken into account as well as the, the fact that all these studies are retrospective in nature and very small patient cohorts. So onto some of the newer literature, um, and I think some exciting uh, aspects. Uh, this was a study that was um, published in the UEG journal uh, in 2019. And this was a retrospective single center experience uh, looking at the outcome of biologics uh, in chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis. So in this group, uh, there was a, about 30 odd patients in the group, again, a small case series or a, a trial. And um, all these patients had, a, had exposure to biological agents or a cyclosporin prior to their colectomy. Then post-colectomy, the patients obviously that were included in the, in the study all were those that had developed chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis. And they were then given either adalimumab, infliximab, or vedolizumab. And when looking at the results, when uh, the, the infliximab and adalimumab group had a, a response rate of uh, 43% and 38% respectively, but vedolizumab seemed to fare somewhat better with a, a response rate of 60%. What was also interesting in this study uh, was the fact that a significant number of, of patients who were on anti-TNF agents stopped therapy uh, and over the long term, uh, compared to the veto group who managed to maintain themselves on the therapy. And the thought behind this is that these patients previously had exposure to anti-TNFs. And so the theory is that they would have had developed significant immunogenicity, essentially having gone on a drug holiday and then restarted the anti-TNF once they developed the pouchitis. And so these patients tended to have infusion reactions and they did not tolerate the drug well compared to the veto lizumab. This is another retrospective study. This is a multi-center US cohort, uh, and this included 83 patients. Um, and uh, what they looked at it specifically was patients who developed Crohn's disease in the pouch. And this was the cause of the pouch failure. So in these patients, the primary outcome was really any clinical or clinical response that occurred at any time point. So if you look at the bar graph to the right where it says ever, uh, if you add the, the response and the remission together, it shows about a 70%, 70% of the patients had a response of sorts to vedolizumab. So it does look promising. 
This is another retrospective study, uh, which, which uh, looked at 13 patients. Um, and this was in Edinburgh between the, the period of 2015 to 2019. And, and this was published uh, about three weeks ago in GUT. 92% um, of these patients, again, a very small cohort of patients, uh, but 92% showed a, a reduction in Pouchartis activity score. Uh, um, these patients uh, halved their fecal calprotectin at a year, and the inflammation levels on pouch biopsy was de were decreased in 71% of the participants. So coming to what probably is the most exciting out of all these trials is the Ernest study, which actually um, finished recruiting or completed uh, on February the 9th, which was yesterday. So hopefully we'll get some results of this study uh, fairly soon, uh, but essentially looking at uh, VEDO uh, prospectively in terms of efficacy and safety in patients with chronic pouchitis. Uh, when, what I saw, they had recruited about 103 patients, and this was across Europe and the USA. So we, uh, we will look forward to hearing, hoping, hopefully positive results. When looking at Ustekinimab, uh, Oleg Rubin et al. Uh, in 2019 published a study, again retrospective, looking at 24 patients. Um, in the uh, graphs on your left, one can see that there was a, uh, some uh, clinical Im improvement, particularly based on the number of bowel movements over a 24-hour period on those patients who were on Ustekinimab, and the median follow-up time was 12 months. Uh, what I thought was even more significant, though, was uh, endoscopic improvement, uh, where you can see the bar graph, 69% uh, of patients who had significant ulceration, so more than 30%, prior to starting ustekinumab, after starting ustekinumab, had a significant improvement in the ulcerated surface area down to less than 10%. So it does appear that there is also endoscopic uh, and probably histologic improvement as well. And this is another prospective study. Look, we're going to probably have to wait a little longer to get these results than the Ernest study, but this is the Socrates study, which is really a Stellara, a stellara for chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis. And this is a Belgium open label multicenter study. Uh, unfortunately, the completion date is May 2023. So uh, we're going to have to hang 10 a little bit for those results. Uh, in terms of the small molecules, um, I didn't find much on the newer agents like the uh, sphingosine agents. But I found just one article really on the JAK inhibitors, uh, which showed that there wasn't a great deal of clinical improvement uh, in real world, real world data um, with the JAK with tofacitinib. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that maybe in the future there will be more studies that will, will, will look at this in more detail. So this is just a little diagram really just to summarize the therapy uh, for patients with pouchitis. Um, so uh, those that are antibiotic responsive, ideally you'd uh, use courses of antibiotics as required. Uh, at this point, uh, probiotics are useful. So this is where BSL-3 comes in. And this is a combination of eight different strains um, of, of bacteria, and it's made up of 450 billion bacteria. And there is some evidence that it can be utilized for both maintenance of remission as well as prophylaxis of further episodes of, uh, of pouchitis. For patients with antibiotic-dependent pouchitis, one would need to consider rotating the antibiotics and ideally using the lowest effective dose of, of antibiotics. And also non-absorbable antibiotics, for example, rifaximin could come into play. And then finally, your antibiotic refractory pouchitis, uh, which is the patient where our patient fits in, really, these are the therapies as we've sort of uh, reviewed. Um, so our patient is sitting in a bit of a tricky position at the moment, uh, and we are currently going to have to counsel this patient on a, a permanent ileostomy because really his symptoms are just uh, really affecting his quality of life. He, he presents frequently with uh, significant diarrhea, and it uh, unfortunately looks like that's the route we're going to have to take. So just some take-home messages uh, from, from this case. Uh, pouch artist is a difficult condition to treat. Uh, we need to consider secondary causes uh, for the presenting symptoms in our patients. And again, Dr. Dotan will, um, will, will allude more to that in the video. And my hope is that the future is potentially bright with agents like Vido and Ustekinumab and hoping even more so with uh, the small molecules. Uh, and with that, I thank you and I will try and answer any questions. Okay, and Mark, can you unscreen it? Oh, that'd be great. Uh, can everybody hear me, I hope? Uh, thank you for a fantastic presentation. It was a really nice overview. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one's actually for me. Um, did you do an MRI of the pelvis at all during um, 
these bouts of, of chronic uh, pouchitis? No, that's the honest answer. We haven't, I don't, me personally, I saw him in October last year. We haven't got an, MR, an MRI of his pelvis. Uh, so no, but that is absolutely warranted. Because obviously um, uh, chronic pouchitis, which is antibiotic resistant, it can be uh, a feature of pelvic sex. So that's yes. always very important to rule out. Okay, then we have um, something from Daniel Surridge. He's a colorectal surgeon. Um, Daniel's asking you, um, what was the rectal cuff length? Because in his experience, uh, a very long cuff will obviously make life more complicated. Sure. Uh, I don't know the exact parameters of hand. Uh, when, I ended, when I scoped him, I mean, it, it, it's pretty short. I think it was about, uh, if I recall, about half a centimeter of, of what, what was left. But I, I don't remember the exact... Uh, uh, dimensions, but I don't think it was a long cuff in this patient. Okay, then a question from Wisdom. Do you consider um, IgG4, do you check IgG4 levels in your patients with refractory parchitis, um, given that it is a possible cause of a refractory parchitis as part of an IgG4 related disease? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great point. Uh, we haven't in him, uh, but I think, again, as you mentioned, when you have a patient with chronic uh, you know, refractory pouchitis, you need to think uh, about other, other, other causes. So absolutely. And then another question to you from Catherine Edwards. I hope this is our Catherine from the UK. I'm not sure. Um, and Catherine says she agrees with Daniel that before moving to therapy, the workup for part dysfunction should include accurate anatomical assessment, length of cuff, relevant surgical technique, um, part effluent culture to guide antibiotic treatment, MRI and imaging. Um, so those are, I think, mostly comments, but... Um, uh, yeah, Catherine is, of course, a, a, an absolute expert in the, the field of inflammatory bowel disease. So thanks for those comments. Yes, thank you. Um, any other questions for Mark? I don't see any others. Mash, do you have anything to that you want to add here? No, I just wanted to add that uh, MRI for pelvis to look for uh, sepsis and so forth is important. But also, if in somebody who doesn't respond to you know your typical uh, an MRE, because you want to exclude uh, Crohn's disease, which indeed may be uh, picked up after the patient has, has a patch. So definitely imaging for, for multiple reasons uh, would be important uh, in this context. Absolutely. Uh, any questions? Maybe we can touch on, I don't know if you looked into it at all, and I'd be interested to hear, for example, what Catherine does. Um, but uh, in patients who have uh, chronic parchitis, what is your approach to doing surveillance for colorectal cancer? Did you look into that at all? So Joel, is that for me or for Catherine? For you. For me. Hopefully Catherine can comment on what they do in the okay. UK. Uh, look, I, I did a little bit of reading around that. Um, so it depends if patients have got significant risk factors, so particularly patients with PSC, uh, those are the sort of patients you're going to survey uh, annually. They do recommend, uh, I think it was ECHO, it was the BSG guideline, where it's recommended that patient, uh, that, that uh, doctors with significant experience in doing pouchoscopy should be the guys doing surveillance. But really, if patients have high-risk features, uh, so PSC or previous malignancy, those are the patients that should have annual uh, pouchoscopy. It's a bit unclear if they don't have those high-risk features, how often patients should have pouchoscopy surveillance. Uh, you know, the cuff is obviously an area that needs to be surveyed, but it's, it's a little bit, they sort of leave it a bit open-ended. I think it's three to five years, if I'm not incorrect, in patients who don't have high-risk features. Uh, so actually, in this guy, it's probably fair to do him at three to five years. Fair enough. My sort of understanding is that if you're low-risk, you don't need part surveillance, but I very much stand to be corrected there. Okay, Catherine says, uh, two yearly surveillance here, try and identify your high-risk. Okay. All right, so I think, uh, thank you very much. There are no other questions on that. Um, so I think we'll move to the video. Cheryl, if you could put it on, please. Are we having any luck loading that video?
Karen or Cheryl, are you here? I'm here, just give me a moment, um, Joel. Oh. It's coming. Thank you very much, Florian. Thank you. These are my disclosures. Thank you, Amir Zdotan from the Rabin Medical Center in Petit Tikva, Israel. And my task is to discuss pouchitis and specifically recurrent pouchitis. And if the previous wonderful talks were a lot of evidence based, so here this is the Wild West, very few uh, hardcore evidence, as you will see in a second. And actually, this is very important because in previous data, up to a quarter of the patients with ulcerative colitis that were discussed here may undergo surgery due to intractable or complicated disease. The number seems to be going down and uh, perhaps in the uh, next talk we'll hear about other options except for pouch surgeries. But until now, the major surgery for patients with ulcerative colitis who need surgery in the end, according to your thoughts, is a uh, pouch surgery where the surgeons will take the, per definition, normal small bowel and will create a pouch. Today, the vast majority of pouches uh, are J pouches. I will not get into the technical details of this operation, which can be performed in one, two, three stages to modify it, and so on and so forth. But in the end, we have a pouch in a patient with ulcerative colitis that was created of a normal small bowel, and we were supposed to solve the situation. But this is not the case. Uh, pouch surgery has pros and some cons, many pros, although they seem to be less. First of all, we take out and eradicate uh, the inflamed mucosa. And by that, it's a 99% decrease in the risk for infants or colorectal cancer. So this is very important for our patients. We preserve intestinal continuity while preserving the anal sphincter. So a patient is continent, very important to our patients. And it was shown by multiple authors that it's better quality of life, sexual function, and of course, importantly, growth for children. There are, however, multiple uh, complications and possible issues that are related to that surgery. I'm not going to go into the vast majority of them, including the fact that there might be mortality. It was shown that it's mainly in centers that do not have a lot of experience in performing uh, these operations, which are complex, large-scale operations. The functional outcomes, a good function of a pouch, means to have six to eight bowel movements in a day, in 24 hours, and one to two bowel movements per night. So this is not something that would be acceptable by many of you for your patients, but this is what is considered normal for a patient after pouch surgery. And of course, multiple complications, small bowel uh, obstruction, there might be pelvic sepsis, uh, there might be issues with an anastomosis, scaphitis, irritable pouch syndrome, issues mainly in the past were with fecundity. But the most important uh, complications for the long term of patients after pouch surgery are uh, pouchitis and the potential to have pouch failure. Now, what is pouchitis? Pouchitis is actually inflammation, uh, de novo inflammation, if you think about it, uh, of the previously normal small bowel uh, that is constructing the ileal pouch. It's an exclusive phenomenon to patients with inflammatory bowel diseases, with ulcerative colitis. So it will not happen um, or will be very rare in patients that undergo a similar operation due to familial adenomatous polyposis. It's the most common long-term complication after pouch surgery, and you see here the numbers that are very various, of course, and heterogeneous, due to the differences in definitions and the long-term follow-up. But in our cohort, up to 60% of patients may have a form, any form of uh, pouchitis as time goes by, and we have a few decades follow-up uh, of them. And pouch failure, which means to have the pouch defunction and having an ileostomy would usually be caused because of chronic pouchitis or Crohn's-like complication of the pouch. So this is something that we all fear of. The etiology of pouchitis is poorly understood, and we definitely think that it's a, some kind of a man-made form of inflammatory bowel disease, actually probably more similar to Crohn's disease. Now, pouch outcomes, this is a clinical and treatment-related talk, so I will not go into the predictors of pouch outcomes. 
not that we know all of them, but what we do know, and this is Aniti and I looking into, into our cohort and showing if you want to sustain a normal pouch, you need to look at the indication for surgery. And patients that were operated due to cancer or dysplasia, that was the very bad news for them, have a higher chance to sustain a normal pouch as the years here go by, compared to patients who were operated due to intractable inflammation telling you that the reason for the pouchitis actually relies in the indication for the surgery and in the tendency of that patient. How do we define, define pouchitis? So we define it clinically, and you would not be impressed with those definitions, not, nor do uh, we. Uh, pouchitis is actually when there's a flare compared to what it, the patient uh, feels as his or her normal, so these six to eight bowel movements a day, if that was the situation. And acute pouchitis would be more than the usual number of bowel movements, usually urgency and cramps, unusual to have uh, rectal bleeding and fever, uh, especially in the adult population. That would be acute pouchitis, usually responding to a short course of therapy. Recurrent acute pouchitis, per our definition, and you see how arbitrary this is, if you have one of those up to four times a year. If you have more than four uh, attacks of acute pouchitis per year, or if you have the symptoms more than four weeks necessitating therapy, we define it as chronic pouchitis and everything that will be associated with perianal fistula strictures or prolonged segments previous to the pouch, proximal to the pouch, would be considered Crohn's-like disease of the pouch. We use the pouchitis disease activity index that was defined by Sanborn and al. in 1994 uh, at the Mayo Clinic, uh, and it consists of clinical, endoscopic and histologic criteria, like all the scores that we use, it's a very, uh, everyone has complaints about these scores, but only recently we started to have efforts to change it or to have another score. Pouchitis is actually very antibiotic responsive. So you see the more you go to the acute forms, it's more antibiotic responsive. The more we move to the chronic forms, per definition, it's more antibiotic dependent or antibiotic refractory. And we'll try to see what can we do, especially in the acute and recurrent acute forms of pouchitis. So what can we use to treat uh, patients with recurrent pouchitis or acute pouchitis? Antibiotics, as you would know, are the first line therapy for pouchitis. Actually, there are few real controlled trials, whether against placebo or against an active comparator. And if you look at the very recent Cochrane, uh, Cochrane review, they found only 15 studies that they thought would qualify to go into that Cochrane review after 40 years of patients having pouches. In uh, our cohort, as you can see, actually the majority of patients uh, would use antibiotics. Uh, of those, it will be usually ciprofloxacin or a combination of ciprofloxacin and metronidazole when you follow up for long term uh, after these patients. And you see that we looked at our cohort for more than 20 years and we see that it doesn't matter how you look at it, half of the patients use uh, some form of antibiotics. And we're now submitting a paper about the very long term that some of these patients might use these antibiotics. And in this long term, we defined it a uh, chronic pouchitis pattern, meaning that the possibility to remain away from this chronic pouchitis pattern goes down the more time goes by. So patients would go into longer and longer periods of uh, treatment with antibiotics. We'll try to be evidence-based, so we'll go to that Cochrane review, which goes back to uh, studies that were years ago, and you see uh, in uh, uh, contrast, in sharp contrast to what was shown so nicely, uh, uh, by Elsa and Janneke in the previous talks about ulcerative colitis and proctitis, where you see these big plots and you see multiple good quality studies. So you see that we have very little study, study or studies. And if we need to make a, a common or comment, cyprofloxacin is more effective and safer if you look at the evidence base compared to metronidazole if you want to take what is said in the Cochrane review, but even those authors say that their uh, confidence in the outcomes uh, of these review are low because of the quality of the studies defined by the Cochrane review, not by me, as having low or very low quality for Cochrane reviews. If you treated a patient with pouchitis, you want to prevent the recurrence of another uh, attack and uh, the um, 
interest in using probiotics for that has increased in the last 20 years, specifically after the Giunchetti studies, showing us that uh, these uh, researchers were able to prevent uh, pouchitis when uh, a probiotic uh, combina combination that was called uh, VSL3 uh, was used to prevent pouchitis actually with uh, uh, impressive results. Again, when the Cochrane reviewers took these studies and tried to evaluate them, the level of evidence was considered low due to several logistic important uh, design-related issues with these studies as well. So what can we do beyond antibiotics and probiotics? First of all, on the right side, uh, you will see several attempts to treat patients with um, compounds that are beyond uh, antibiotics. I will say, and I didn't go into each and every antibiotic, because in addition to ciprofloxacin and metronidazole, people looked at tinidazole, at rifaximin, as you would know, but the level of evidence there is very low. Here, it's even lower, so it's reports. It's not usually randomized control studies. So there were attempts to go against the symptoms using, for instance, these with carbamer enemas. Perhaps we should look at it again. Octreotide, tacrolimus was a star here again uh, as an enema. Alicaforsen as an enema, the anti-ICAM. Fecal microbiotal transplantation, which until now did not show a lot of um, uh, uh, help. Immunoglobulins, exclu exclusive uh, enteral diet. So you might find almost everything. But what's more interesting to look at is that in the recent uh, two decades, actually every treatment that is being used for patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease for that sake is being used for patients with pouchitis telling you and myself that we are actually believing that this is a form of IBD and we will go to treat patients with mesalamine, with systemic steroids or budesonide, sometimes with immunomodulators and with all the biologic agents that you have, including very recently vedolizumab and mustakinumab from Kobe Olech from our group when he was still uh, in Chicago. So antibiotics or biologics, you see here a summary of the studies for antibiotics and biologics, and you see that none is doing very well if you look at them for the long term. When we are using antibiotics, which we are using, and I told you just now that we are using them long term, we should take into account that this might be, of course, a double-edged sword. We have shown a few years ago already, this is a, a study published by us, and Lea Reche from our group published it in Gastro, showing that in patients treated with immunomodulators, long-term antibiotics or biologics, the combination and the composition and the diversity of the microbiome was naturally different, as you might envision. But Danny Dubinsky from our group has just published in Gastroenterology again, showing that the diversity indeed changes depending on if you treat a patient now on antibiotics or if you stop antibiotics. That would also be intuitive. But what would be intuitive and dangerous is that we are growing a very resistant microbiome for these patients. And that might have an effect, of course, not only on the patient, but on his uh, uh, family and on us as public, uh, uh, on, on the, as the public. How can you manage pouchitis? In addition, I think that this is also important, not only how you treat it, but of course, when you see a patient, you need to take a very good history because here there is also a differential diagnosis. This is why you need also to take blood and fecal tests and to scope the patients to do a pouch endoscopy. If you believe that the disease that you're seeing is pouchitis, you treat the patient with a short course, usually two weeks of antibiotics. Those would be ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, or their combination. And if the patient is responding, as will happen, and in the Dubinsky paper by us, it's 89% will respond. The problem is that they will recur, and if you see our microbiome analysis, you understand why, and then you need to treat them again. If you encounter uh, other attacks of pouchitis, better assess the patients again to see that there is nothing else, no pelvic sepsis. You need additional assessments, including MRI, sometimes examination under anesthesia, and additional imaging procedures to know what you are dealing with. And if the patient is going back, that's, that was not our task. But if the patient is becoming too recurrent, which would mean actually a chronic disease patient, consider treating this patient and admitting that this is an inflammatory bowel disease and treat it as you treat inflammatory bowel disease. 
in order to try and maintain these patients that are so antibiotic responsive. I'd like just to highlight that. And of course, as uh, Florian alluded to kindly, we are very involved in research looking into pouchitis, thinking that this is actually a model for the development of inflammatory bowel disease. So Lehi Godney from our group is trying to look if she can modify the microbiome with the diet whether the Mediterranean diet, specific carbohydrate diet, or specifically personalized diets, so that after patients are taking antibiotics, their microbiome is more stable, perhaps uh, postponing the next attach, attack uh, of pouchitis, but this remains to be determined. Before we summarize, let me read to you what the Cochrane reviewers were saying. The effects of antibiotics, probiotics, and other interventions for treating and preventing pouchitis are uncertain. Well-designed, adequately powered studies are needed to determine the optimal therapy for the treatment of prevention of pouchitis. So we can say good luck with that. That's not easy to do, but we definitely need to take that into account. If I need to summarize, ulcerative colitis patients after pouch surgery have distinct medical and surgical problems. Up to 60% of them may have uh, pouchitis, pouch inflammation, which is the novel inflammation of the previously normal small bowel. Assessment of pouch problems requires multidisciplinary team. I didn't even go into the multidisciplinary aspect of it, which is very important and was presented in this meeting as well as others. Pouchitis is the most antibiotic responsive inflammatory bowel disease. I will say that. First line therapy is still antibiotics. Two weeks course, usually of ciprofloxacin or metronidazole, but traditional IBD therapies may be required and maybe even the more appropriate therapies. A comprehensive uh, pouch clinic concept, you know that we believe that this is a tool that it does enable uh, providing the multidisciplinary care that those patients need, and research assessing it is the key to understanding more on pouch uh, uh, outcomes and on inflammatory bowel diseases. And with that, and with thanking our multidisciplinary team, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yes, I think that was a very nice overview on the subject. So we just have a couple of questions. Um, I seem to have lost the chat. Oh, here we go. All right, so Jonathan Bowden asks, does a fecal culprit perform well in predicting disease to limit uh, repetitive pouchoscopies if the symptoms are from an irritable pouch syndrome? So my understanding is that fecal culprotectin will be quite sensitive for a pouchitis, but of course, you know, not everybody who has a pouch who has symptoms has got pouchitis. So you would still need to have biopsies. You would still need to look at the cuff, at the pre-pouch um, ileum, looking for features of Crohn's disease. And I think um, Catherine's also uh, responded here to that. And I'll just read you her response. She says um, in our unit, which is the UK. Sorry for interrupting. Um, Catherine, maybe you can ask Catherine to unmute and-, and, and Yes, just that, that would actually you. be nice. <laughs> Hi everybody, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Hi, really nice to see everyone. Hello, South Africa yeah, yeah. and the rest of Africa. It's very cold here in the UK. We have snow. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a really difficult problem, Jill. And it's one of the, I think, one of the most challenging parts of our IBD management in clinic. And so much so that we try and keep these patients in a, in a specialized clinic. So clinicians, multidisciplinary clinicians can work together. I thought the overview talk we've just heard touched on a lot of the uh, issues when you're assessing these patients and it's about making sure that you are actually treating pouchitis uh, before you get to deciding what you're going to do because there are just so many different factors that may be contributing to the dysfunction of the pouch. And so I do think early anatomical assessment, know, know your surgeon well, understand what your surgeon does, uh, most surgeons now are doing J pouches with stapled anastomoses. They're very aware that they should leave the minimum amount of cuff in order to get the best results. But nevertheless, you still can be hoodwinked. And even St. Mark's and Sue Clark at St. Mark's will always go back to basics and relook at that rectal segment, look at the anatomy. 
um, will get the MRI, as you pointed out, to make sure that you haven't got any late sepsis complications in the pelvis. Obviously, early, early septic com uh, complications are more, more frequent. And the patient that uh, Mark presented, of course, disappeared uh, in that very early phase where you perhaps would be assessing the pouch a little bit more and giving a little bit more support. But simple things like we've just heard about dietary assessments, dietary intolerances, how do you differentiate pouch dysfunction from small bowel intestinal overgrowth? They're both going to respond potentially to antibiotics if you're using empirical therapies. So just thinking more widely around those diseases, I think Mosheko pointed out the importance of systemic disease producing gut dysfunction and that gut dysfunction is going to be the same whether you've got a pouch or whether you've got uh, your colon in, in, in continuity because the gut has only got so many ways of being unhappy. So um, I've been caught out in the past by not assessing the anal canal properly. Uh, you get stricturing and narrowing of what well, after the pouch anal anastomosis and you get like a semi-obstructive uh, pouch dysfunction. So sometimes you need to do something called a pouchogram a contrast study where you, or even a defecating pouch gram, not nice for the patients, but you actually watch about, you watch the expellation of, of contrast medium during defecation. Now, the more sophisticated form of that is a, a, a pelvic dynamic MRI, but actually you can get a lot of, you can get a lot of information from some pretty simple, simple tests. But let's say we've done all that and, our, and we, we haven't got cuffitis, we haven't got, uh, we haven't got a stricture, we haven't got obstruction to pouch outlet, we've got a straightforward pouchitis. And so you start out, we, you know, you start with the simple antibiotics and I understand in South Africa that's really challenging uh, for, because you can't upgrade to a biologic therapy. And I have to say in my practice, I have found that the most helpful uh, second line step. Once I've gone through the culture, and I think culturing your effluent is uh, transformed my practice, because you will get resistance to your first choice antibiotics, and you need to be able to rotate. And so by rotating through, and, and if you can, interspersing with a probiotic, I think you can actually maintain patients for much longer. Do you use uh, rifaximin in your practice? Yeah, I, I do. It's tests down the algorithm. Uh, I think again, St. Mark's original algorithm for for you know culture and pouchitis management suggests you, you do try rifaximin. I've had some good results with it. Um, I like it because it's non-absorbed. Uh, and uh, but again, uh, you've. I think you can be you can be duped. Sometimes I've had a couple of responses to refact me in that in, in retrospect, I think when I've used it empirically, I felt have been small bowel intestinal overgrowth and not actually pouchitis, chronic pouchitis. Okay, thanks so much for your comments, Catherine. Love oh, to see okay. you. Um, for our colorectal surgeons, and I did see I think Paul's on, and I know Daniel's on. Um, just a question from me: Would you ever consider doing a pouch for somebody with Crohn's disease? And if you would ever consider it. Who would you consider it on? Daniel? No takers there. Julian? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do elaborate, Julian. <laughs> um, Chris, it's, look, it's a long time since I've had to do these. So this is from uh, ancient memory, but a pouch is a difficult enough procedure without greatly increasing your risk of failure. And I remember one series that I think deliberately did pouches for Crohn's patients that they thought were suitable and at least 50% had to be taken down. So if you're prepared to say to your patient, uh, well, we've got a 50% chance of success, uh, perhaps you can think about it, but I think it's just too risky. But as I said, I'm out of date with current practice. Okay, and then there's another question. How do you differentiate Cuffitis from pouchitis, histologically. Um, 
I actually don't know the answer to that. Mike, Mike Lopitz, I saw you were on. Would, would you be able to answer that? Mike's a pathologist. Catherine, can you answer that? <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, yes, yeah, so the cuff is that uh, retained rectal tissue that sits just below the anastomosis. It's really difficult to biopsy because you're on your way out of the pouch and your patient, you're right on the anal margin there. And so you sometimes make us, the patient a little bit uncomfortable. So what you're seeing in, in that will be it will, it will not be altered small bowel tissue that you'll see from your cuff. It will be altered rectal tissue. And you're looking there, of course, for the evidence of inflammation. And, and it is very, very difficult to treat. Again, I've had, had success with using lignocaine uh, installation, so Instagel. Uh, there's some minor non-randomized evidence for lignocaine in UC itself which seems to be effective providing you continue to use it. It's when you stop using it uh, for rectal UC or proctitis, uh, it, you, you run into problems. So cuffitis, I've used lignocaine. Uh, sometimes if you've got, uh, if it's associated with some anal stenosis, you may need to get the patients to self-dilate. But again, this is the importance of having a multidisciplinary uh, a team. You can use um, suppos steroid suppositories for the cuffitis just as you would uh, uh, or 5-ASA just as you would for UC. So it comes back to that point of treating the underlying disease. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Mesh? Um, Jill, I was just gonna say, Daniel has got his hand up. I don't know if it's a- Oh, great. Daniel, please unmute. Sorry, I was, I was fumbling the button earlier. I was busy talking. I didn't realize it wasn't going through, sorry. Um, just about about doing a pouch in in a, a Crohn's patient in my practice, no, I would not. But if you're having a look at the literature, it is coming through more these days that if you have a very involved patient who is very well controlled um, with access to to obviously proper medical and biological care, you can actually do a pouch, provided you continue to manage them afterwards, and they are having some reasonable results. So it's. From my point of view, no, I won't do it now, but it is very much a watch the space. I think it's going to be coming soon. Great, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Um, can I ask Daniel? Uh, Daniel, you know, anecdotally, when you speak to patients, um, they, they seem to be quite happy with their bags, their stoma bags. So I've been wondering whether there's data to say that actually the requests to have a, you know, restored a continuity of function are actually getting less and less over time. Uh, so are you seeing that in your practice that uh, there are fewer patients um, who are requesting uh, this procedure? Um, yeah. I think, I think in our group of patients, most people come, come to the doctor not wanting a bag at all. And when you talk through the procedure with them, you'll say, look, it'll be temporary, they'll have it reversed. And most of them will accept that. And you know, there's a subset, a few of them that will then come to you afterwards and go, look, this is so terrible. I want the bag put back. And it is, it, it's a minimum of them. It's really not all that many. Um, I must confess, it's, it's the, the FAP patients do much, do much better, obviously. The, the, the UC patients, occasionally they'll come back and say that you know, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're not coping, but they don't want the bag. And very few will come back and say that they do want the bag put in. But I've not had one say, look, I'm fine. Don't reverse it. Mm. Um, I think it might just be our population that we deal with, that it, there's a lot of stigma attached to stomas that we still haven't been able to get over. But most patients don't like the idea of, of, of having a bag up and cutting. Yeah. Okay, I think we're pretty much out of time. So if there's no other comments, I'd just like to um, end off um, just by thanking, first of all, UEGW for uh, the loan of the video. We meant to have a slide up here of that. Okay. Um, there's also an advert for the upcoming Congress, apparently. Okay. Um, next week, all right, so that's um, the Congress for this uh, coming year. And I'm sure you all, well, many of you were uh, part of this last year and it was really a very, very good uh, Congress uh, virtually. 
And then um, we also have um, uh, another uh, gecko next week, and that is on HCC screening and treatment. And then um, I'd also just like to thank uh, ECHO, uh, University of New Mexico, as well as the ECHO India team. And just to remind you that there are feedback forms available in the chat and the recordings are also available on the Gastro Foundation website. So thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed it um, and uh, see you in a month's time. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Bye.